Okay, everyone. Okay, okay. Okay. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, welcome to... Crypto Mondays, we're going to get going in just a minute, and uh, so I'd ask you guys to take a uh, another piece of pizza if you want, or uh, some more wine or some more beer, and take a seat. And we are about to get going with um, with a little talk about building on EOS versus Ethereum, and a deep dive into the tools and best practices for each chain from Angel and Ross. So uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you guys for coming out um, and thank you very much for rocket space for being our host uh, at crypto Mondays we believe in putting on events that are informative fun and social uh, we believe in community and if you look at the last part of community that is unity so we're really trying hard to make that happen make the crypto unity happen here in the Bay Area and it's so much fun to have uh, our brothers and sisters from LA LA represent, right, LA in the house, all right. Up here for the uh, EOS Hackathon and a bunch of other events. So uh, EOS is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like when the Dodgers come to visit up north, you know. EOS is here visiting. And consensus consensus is, uh, is across the street. So I think it's been more of an Ethereum-centric uh, town, but hopefully we're going to change that tonight. So big thanks to Rocket Space for hosting us and being our sponsor. Big thanks to BeFast TV. So right now, BeFast is live streaming. So BeFast TV slash Crypto Mondays is uh, the URL where you can find the archive of all our stuff. Uh, tonight's event and tonight's event will be available for replay as soon as we're done here. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Ross and Angel to come on up and um, start our stuff. Do you want? Okay. All right, it's a hundred percent Ross. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Hey, Andy, do you know how to get the screen down? And then, uh, yeah, we just plug in the laptop over here. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, projector. Okay, screen down. There we go. Ooh. All right, there we go. So I think you just plug in here, and we're all. All ready to go. So just like curiosity, who here in the audience is a developer? Hands up. All right, all right. Okay, great. Who here is here just for the pizza and the beer? All right, all right. I think it's a equally split. Okay, and who here is an influencer? That guy back there is an influencer. And this guy here. All right. Yeah. She should be here any minute. Fiji, do you know when she's going to be here? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So there were these two daps walking down the street, and uh, never mind. I won't. I won't go there. I won't go there. Exactly. Exactly. So who here? Who here has not been to a crypto event this year? Wow. That's like nobody except you. Wow. Who here promises they're not going to go to any more crypto events this year? 
That would be me. Okay. Yeah, Nathan and, I, Nathan and I were at three events together in the last two weeks, so I think we're kind of done. Um, all right, so we're just uh, setting up here. Uh, Andy, did you have a chance to tweet that? The okay, so I'd like, who here, does everyone use Twitter here? Yep. Okay, uh, do us a favor and go follow SF Crypto Mondays. SF Crypto Mondays with an S. And what we've done is we've tweeted out um, we tweeted out a link to uh, for you guys to give us feedback on the event tonight, and that would be super helpful. Uh, the person you saw downstairs, a little scruffy beard, who let you into the elevator, that's my son, and he's a freshman in college, and he's studying information uh, sciences, so he's all excited. He made a whole form and everything, and he's like, hey, Dad, I set this up, and let's not hand out the paper. Let's do it. And I said, yeah, but the problem is, Paper works like you get a you get 80% compliance with paper. You get really low compliance with links. And he said, No, that's not true. I said, Okay, let's try it out. So let's uh, let's prove him right and prove me wrong. Uh, SF Crypto Mondays um, on Twitter. And then if you guys could give us some feedback uh, during or after the event, that would be great. The other thing too is uh, we're having our last event of the year in three weeks on December 3rd. Uh, Andy back there is our, hi Andy, Andy's uh, my other co-organizer, and Erez here will be our new co-organizer starting shortly, but um, Andy will be running our event December 3rd, I'll be over at the Oric Law Firm. So that's going to be a big year-end event, um, making predictions for next year and all that sort of stuff, so if uh, we have some really exciting guests lined up for that. A uh, beautiful rooftop, view of the bridge, all that sort of thing. Uh, I need an, adapter. an adapter. You. Uh, yeah, no worries. All right. Is there a dongle in the house? Yes. How many developers does it take to? Make a dongle work. <laughs> so, um, okay, so December 3rd, that's going to be a really good uh, a good one. Um, like I said, it's on the rooftop. It's got a view of the bridge, uh, the Bay Bridge, really nicely catered and all that sort of thing. So the Eventbrite for that is up. So, all right, there we go. Success. There we go. So, so Ross, the PDF is going to be shared as well. Okay. So, without further ado, Ross, take it away, and please remember to talk in the mic so it comes up on the live stream. I will try. But if you can't hear me, let me know, and I'll adjust. All right. So, uh, my name is Ross Kiesman. Uh, I work at Sense down in LA. We uh, make a decentralized messenger built on EOS, and I'm here to talk about. Um, tooling or a piece of tooling uh, for EOS called Demux.js. Um, uh, so I saw a few developers in the audience. If you're a developer or not a developer and interested in uh, tooling for EOS, then you'll find this interesting. Um, so that's good. If you're not, then I'll try to get finished quickly so the pain will be over and we can get on to something that's more interesting. So um, yeah, I'm talking about uh, Demux.js. So why Demux? What are, what are the problems that uh, Demux is trying to address? Uh, so there is a sort of fundamental mismatch between uh, the data that the blockchain can provide us either through uh, the smart contract or, or through uh, just querying the actions uh, that go on and then what your, your, uh, uh, you know, your front end or your, your application needs. So um, this Demux is kind of trying to provide a, a better way than just asking the blockchain for what you need. Um, because you might end up like having to query multiple times, a lot of back and forth. Uh, and to scale all of these queries, then you're going to need to like run a bunch of nodes. And that gets you know expensive. So uh, also, smart contracts, d um, at least on, uh, on EOS, I believe on Ethereum, they do. They don't emit events. So if you wanted to do something like 
you know, get updated, get updates as soon as a certain action happened. There's currently no way to do that. Uh, and you can poll, of course, but with polling, um, uh, e there's complications there because the, the chain can, you know, end up getting forked, and so you need to allow for that in, in your sort of polling setup. So it's perfectly, uh, s perfectly possible to do all of that, but they've gone ahead and done it for us, which is, uh, uh, which is nice. So DMUX.js um, is a JavaScript library, and it is uh, officially supported and maintained by Block One and the people who are working on EOS. Uh, and it basically pulls the blockchain for you and then gives you some tooling, some sort of uh, places to listen for, for events. Uh, so it's sort of for event sourcing. Uh, and then these events can be used for updating um, you know, the persistence layer that you, pers uh, you choose to use for your app. So it could be a Postgres database, whatever. It's agnostic to that. Uh, and also you can use it for updating or for executing other sort of um, uh, side effect producing actions, like if you wanted to call an external API or even initiate another transaction, another EOS transaction, you could go ahead and do that. So it's pretty useful. It's kind of a Swiss Army knife. Um, all right, so base, the basic steps of implementing uh, DMUX.js uh, for, for your DAP are as follows. You need to create uh, a child class of this abstract action handler, which is part uh, provided by uh, EOSJ, or, uh, by um, uh, Dmux, uh, and you will need to sort of import an action reader for your chain. So uh, Dmux.js is also agnostic to the blockchain um, that, you are, that you're using. Uh, I'm speaking about it from an EOS perspective, but there are also action readers for, uh, I believe, for Steam it, and also for, Maybe some others. I'm not sure what's out there. Um, so you'll need to basically have uh, an action reader that can pull your blockchain, like knows how to talk to your blockchain, ask for what it needs. Um, and then you'll need to write action handlers, which is the fun part. Uh, they listen for certain actions, and then they're going to do something. Uh, and then once you do that, you basically need to instantiate uh, this base watcher action, so create uh, an instance of this of this class and then call watch on it, and then it's gonna go off and do its thing. So I'll kind of walk you through that real quick. This is pretty much uh, like the standard basic uh, uh, implementation or, or uh, um, uh, an abstract action of the abstract action handler. So what it's doing, um, I'm not gonna go too far into it, but it's sort of, uh, executing on each block and uh, it's maintaining a state uh, object here it's just a you know standard JavaScript object but normally I think in a, in a production uh, case you might have like a, a reference to a database or something like that and uh, what it's doing is kind of um, you know iterating making it's keeping track of uh, which block you're on and in the case of a uh, uh, yeah, a fork if you need to roll back and replay uh, it allows it has some some stuff to do that so this is kind of the boring part uh, the interesting stuff is actually in here. So there are event handlers, as I, as I explained earlier. And there are two types of event handlers. Uh, there are what they call effects, which are things that would like, as I explained earlier, kind of maybe call an external service or uh, do something like, um, you know, initiate an, uh, an EOS uh, transfer, uh, token transfer transaction. So uh, what you'll do here is uh, sort of, uh, I can't, I guess my mouse doesn't show up on the screen, so I'll walk over here. Uh, yeah, there's two main parts to one of these. You'll have an action type, and it'll be a string, and you just tell it the name of the action you're looking to match. So if it was a token transfer, it'd be a token, or eosio.token, um, colon, colon, transfer, uh, and then something that, you, uh, a, a, a function that you want to execute. So like up here in the body of this function, you're going to get uh, the state, which is, um, uh, so these can accumulate state. Uh, you have, uh, uh, like, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you could pass uh, an object in there or a reference to a database, and you have access to that. So you can kind of, like, for instance, um, have a running tally of the transactions that have gone through, that have, you know, each time this executed, you could increment it, decrement it, whatever you want. Uh, you'll have the payload from the action, uh, information about the uh, the block and uh, context is just a, a way of passing uh, things uh, from action to action without actually um, having to you know deal with your state. So it's uh, just an additional helper. Um, 
And so that's, that's one type of event handler. The second is uh, for actually updating things in the, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I've gotten these backwards. So this, these are the updaters and these are the effects. So in the updaters, you, you would have the, uh, the ac access to the state and uh, you are mainly um, you know, doing things like persisting to a database. And in this case, uh, you don't have access to the state, but you can uh, you know, create side effects um, in, in this, uh, in this uh, it's, it's essentially the same. You know, you'll be listing an action that, you, that you're interested in and then tell it what to do. And it's an array, you can put multiples, um, you match on different actions, and uh, they're also versionable. So uh, what this allows you to do is uh, give it a version and it will um, automatically choose the latest version to execute, but when you replay, uh, it can go and um, you know, find the appropriate version. So let's... Uh, Move on, and so yeah, to bring it all together, this is like some code that would maybe be in the entry point to, to the application, and you're going to um, have the appropriate action reader. In this case, it's the uh, Node EOS action reader. Uh, you point it at uh, an endpoint for um, a node, so maybe one of the public nodes, or probably one that you're running, uh, just so you can have some like guaranteed uptime. Uh, and then you can tell it which block you want to start from. So maybe you're deploying your dApp today, you don't need to go through the entire blockchain and like listen to all these events because nothing uh, of interest happened there. Um, and then you pass that uh, and your, uh, your, your handlers into uh, to the, the base action watcher here and tell it how frequently you want to pull and then you call watch and then it's going to start and it's going to go do its thing. Uh, so some practical use cases. Uh, I've mentioned a few of these already, but say you have uh, some sort of social media app and there's two things. There's a, a post action where you're creating new, uh, new posts and there's a like action. So you could go and listen to both of these and then persist them to your own database so you can query them in whatever way you want. You could even you know, do it in a, um, they could be in different uh, tables and you could have some sort of relation between them that the blockchain doesn't really allow in, in that way. So it gives you some more flexibility. Um, you can publish actions into some sort of pub sub queue so other services in your stack can listen for them and then do whatever. Uh, you can send push notifications to, to uh, mobile devices. So this is something that we do uh, currently. Uh, we have a wallet um, part of our app, and when tra transactions come in, we listen for the transactions, and if it's a transaction from one of our users, then we can you know, tell them that they have a transaction, send a push notification. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super useful. It's like a, uh, it's a Swiss Army knife. Uh, so here are some quick little recipes I made, and if we are lucky, they will work. I was having some issues earlier. So this one here is a, an, eff <laughs> an effect uh, listener, and what it does is it basically listens for, um, point again, I need a laser pointer. Uh, so this is just listening for the, uh, the token transfer um, events that we all know, and uh, it's running this action here. And all it does is just, um, oh, there's a little IPFS client here. So it is publishing all of these transactions to uh, this uh, feed here. And I wrote a little front end. It's possibly the ugliest React app that ever existed, but it will, if we're lucky. Uh oh, yeah, one second here. Let me just make sure that everything is running and I'm connected to the internet. Oh, I am connected to the internet. All right, let me see here. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's odd, okay. Okay. This is a live demo. Anything can go wrong, so, and they tend to. Um, all right, one second here.
right, so what we should see, and it might take a second for these to start updating, but um, it's listening to that feed that I showed you earlier, and it should start publishing transactions any minute now. Any minute now. Let me see. It's listening. One more time. Let's see if we're having issues. Mm, uh oh. Okay, technical difficulties. Anyhow, I'm going to skip these. I think that maybe. There, it's having connections, is, connection issues to IPFS, but um, yeah, so let's just skip this. So this one, yeah, like if, if this is working, uh, we would have seen a list of transactions just appearing in real time. So um, you can, it's maybe not the most interesting example because, you know, there are already like block explorers that show you this, but if you, if you imagine like in the case of that uh, social media app that I mentioned earlier, you could have those uh, actions pushed to the users in real time, which is really nice and quite simple. You know, it's just a couple lines of code. Uh, the next example, um, which I'm not even going to bother trying to run, uh, is an example of a sort of an action that's accumulating state. So this is using the updater. And it's still listening for the EOSIO uh, token transfers. But instead, it's just um, in the state, it's setting what the, the, the largest transaction was by amount. And then once it comes to the next transaction, it compares. And if it's larger, then it you know, replaces it. So it allows you to keep a running sort of uh, uh, a record of what the largest transaction is currently. So uh, you can do a lot of interesting things with that as well. Um, I think uh, you get the point, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I know I'm talking this library up a lot, but uh, uh, and I like it. I think it's great. But there are some downsides, and you know, it does add complexity. Like, how great is it that we can use a blockchain as our backend and not have to worry about backends? That's great. Um, now you are like ad introducing an additional dependency, an additional thing you need to maintain. So there's that. Um, it's no longer trustless. So if you are going and recording all these actions and putting them in a database that you control, uh, there you're losing that sort of. Um, trustlessness of the blockchain. You no longer have those guarantees. So maybe in some cases you need to either provide the user a reference to the blockchain, like record uh, sort of a, a, you know, the block hash or something like that so they can perhaps verify for themselves. Or in really, you know, um, important cases you might want to just allow them to look at the blockchain themselves. So, so query it directly. Um, Another thing is uh, that this is only available in JavaScript right now. Dmux uh, JS is a JavaScript uh, library, as you might imagine. So yeah, um, if you're not into JavaScript or you know maybe you have some other runtime on your back end, um, th there's that. But it's uh, you know a fairly small library. You could re-implement it, and that'd be great to see see projects like that. Uh, we at Sense we're kind of an Elixir shop on the back end, and so we've been. Uh, Maybe discussing implementing something similar in uh, in Elixir, which uh, which would be fun. But yeah, um, that's my talk. Uh, this was uh, Dmux JS. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. It's not right now, but I could put it online. Um, but uh, if I don't get around to that, you can still go to the Dmux repo, Dmux JS. Um, it's on the EOSIO GitHub account. And they have a really great example project. Um, it's the examples are different than this, but it's like you know it lays out exactly how to use it, and it's pretty uh, pretty nice. So yeah, you could look at that. But I'll try and post this up, and maybe I don't know, like put something on Slack, or I'll let you know directly. So yeah, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you very much, Ross. And he'll be back for the panel in just a moment. And f uh, but first. We're going to have a presentation from the first lady of crypto, <laughs> the one and only Crystal I've Just Forked Rose. <laughs> Here she is. Thank you. I was trying to hide that under my Patagonia sweater. I feel like when you're in San Francisco, the 
de facto outfit is Patagonia. So I was really grateful for uh, the EOS hackathon to give us these nice Patagonia sweaters. And um, so I was just there, and many of you were. Eli, congratulations for your win on social impact. You had a really amazing project. Um, we are super fortunate that we're in a town of builders. I think that San Francisco, you know, inherently has a lot of people who are early adopters, and that's where we are with, with the tech technology that we're talking about today. So um, Ross is going to pop open just uh, GitHub for me because I think rather than a presentation with slides, it's easier since we're, you know, more familiar with, uh, with code to kind of open this up. So what I was going to talk about was just simply um, Ethereum, porting Ethereum to EOS. So we have sort of gotten into our DAP ecosystem uh, with a slow start. I feel like if you have coded on Ethereum at all you and tried to go beyond smart contracts and make an application, um, unless you're CryptoKitties and you did genetics, uh, even then you found out the limitations of Ethereum, which is you know this transaction speeds and cost. Um, cool, yeah, yes, please. Um, we can just pop open, I'm going to go to Shio. So actually, I'll just show you, um, I love live demos. I think sh live demos are really amazing. Um, Shios is a block producer, so I'm here representing both Shios and Sense, our company. Uh, Shios is a block producer that's all female founded. The Cybercode twins are part of our block producer, just officially announced today. Yeah. We have, uh, we've done this with the mission of uh, giving the block rewards back to the community in scholarships for women in technology. So there are, if you know how EOS works, there's inflation on the network that is paid out to the people who produce the network. This is a better system than mining. I think if we think about proof of work, like look at the inefficiencies of the networks today. And this is the beginning of why I believe Ethereum is inefficient. I Ethereum is still working on proof of work. Proof of work is basically just eating up network resources for the purpose of solving cryptographic puzzles so that we can, you know, distribute uh, at tokens in a, in some, you know, how, whatever the rate is currently right now with the hash. I think it's going to be f 100 years to get to the next 4 million Bitcoin, something like that. But if you think about the rate of, of how things are produced, um, it's inefficient. And so proof of stake came next. And proof of stake would be a really fantastic thing for Ethereum to move to. That's what Casper is. If you heard about Casper, that's what was supposed to happen. It's actually now called Shasper. They've decided to introduce sharding. It's not going to be Casper anymore. Uh, but still, it hasn't, it hasn't come around. So EOS leapfrogged all of it. And EOS came out with delegated proof of stake. And delegated proof of stake means you get to vote for the people on the network who are producing the network. And those uh, nodes get to earn some amount of EOS every day. And that is coming from inflation on the network. And by producing that EOS every day, you're incentivizing amazing community leaders uh, to keep building, keep, keep the nodes on the network. So we have, uh, let's see if we can find. You can vote for Shios. You can vote for anyone if you're holding EOS. I'll just look up Shios here because it's easier. And so one of our contributions uh, to the network is what we call um, EOS 21. So if you are familiar with ERC-20, what has happened with ERC-20, well, Ethereum itself was an ICO in 2015. Uh, they raised $19 million, so they did really well for their ICO. And then they started to launch other tokens on top of them. But it only happened when they created ERC-20. So ERC-20 came around, and new tokens were able to be launched on the network. And it enabled other people to do the number one use case for Ethereum, which is raise an ICO. It also allowed people to rapidly create their own smart contracts and their own tokens and instead of forking the network, um, like we forked. <laughs> That's uh, for later. Um, so. ERC-20 um, has a lot of really amazing applications, but what we have discovered is that we really needed a protocol that would be able to move ERC-20 tokens out of Ethereum and onto the EOS network if we wanted to build applications there. So I'm building an application called Sense Chat. Sense is a, it's a decentralized messenger, and it only could be possible on a network that has no fees or low fees, but thank, thank goodness EOS has no fees. Um, Sense is just a, it's a chat messenger that needs the ability for us to be able to process many, many transactions. And 
Unfortunately, with Ethereum, you have to pay gas in order to get your transactions pushed through in a fast way, and the gas increases the more that's on the network. When CryptoKitties was at its peak, the most that Ethereum did in a day was 14 transactions a second, I believe. Um, that can be verified, just look online. And EOS has the promise of doing you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and so we're just really excited about the network. And we know there are others, but one of the compelling things about EOS also is that it's decentralized. So if you were to build on Stellar, you're building on a more enterprise centralized network. If you were to build on you know, maybe Neo, you might still find a community, but also have that, that hesitation on whether or not it's decentralized. It, EOS is great because it has a decentralized component to it. And so we're really excited about uh, being able to move, but the challenge is we raised our ICO on Ethereum. So, you know, our token today is still Ethereum. This up here, it's doing as well as the rest of the market. Um, and it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, that means that we have to figure out how to move it. So what we did was we created a protocol called ERC, or I'm sorry, EOS21, which is ERC22, EOS21, and it's the teleportation protocol. And it's super simple. It's open source. Uh, it basically just takes everything in a smart contract, throws it into a black hole once the user decides that they want to move their tokens over. So, uh, you know, the original move, if you have EOS and you had it in the early days before they moved on to their own network when they're still on Ethereum, you had to wait for the snapshot, register, you know, freak out a little bit whether or not your exchange is going to actually support it, and then move it over. Uh, so this is just for any founder, any developer that wants to move over their tokens. You can go to uh, this GitHub, which is Shia's org GitHub, and grab the protocol. Um, also, any developers who want to join in and, and add anything to it, we're looking for people to help. This was created because Sense had the necessity to move our own token, um, and we had a lot of contributors, Angel Jose and other uh, contributors, as well as Ben Sigmund, who is still, I think, on route from another US event. So it's been a very long, amazing weekend of events. Really excited and happy to be here. And uh, please just chat with our team if you want any other info on how to move tokens from Ethereum onto EOS. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you very much, Crystal. So now we're going to try and uh, even things out, get a little bit of representation in the house from consensus um, and the uh, Ethereum side. I would like to uh, invite our panelists up. Um, Crystal, do you want to join the panel? Sure. Well? Okay. Thank so, um, all right, we're going to, this isn't, uh, so we okay. maybe we move these up so we're out of the light a little bit. Oh, never mind. Okay, over to you guys. Well, cool. Uh, Ross, do you want to join? Yeah, join us. Okay, cool. So, uh, Pavan feels a little bit, <laughs> it looks like a three to one EOS versus Ethereum, but that's not really the way it's going to be. Well, so. technically we're Ethereum first. And actually I still really appreciate and love the network. And I do think it has a lot of, I'll be, I'll be the voice of neutrality because I, I did, if it weren't, weren't for Ethereum, we wouldn't be where we are today for our company. Okay. And, and from the technical standpoint, I, I've worked both on Ethereum and EOS and I can appreciate things on both networks and some of the the things that there's things that I like in Ethereum that are lacking on EOS and uh, you know you got to acknowledge that and there's things that are lacking in Ethereum that I like on EOS so you have to acknowledge that so I don't think it's so much a shootout just uh, comparing the differences and seeing what's best for you and your DAP development goals so uh, yeah we can talk differences and, and questions take questions I don't know what the format is for the panel if we're moderating or not I think we're missing our moderator potentially with Ben Sig. Um, <laughs> so if you want to ask some questions, yeah, that'd be I'm great. Or we can take really questions awesome from anyone questions here. I mean, it's, you guys. it's intimate enough for us to make this a conversation between everyone. And I think if anybody has conversations or questions that they wanted to ask. All righty. So let's let's start from the beginning. Um, why don't we just go down the line, just do quick intros, so we all know who all you are, all you all are, and then we'll just hop right into things. I'm okay. Ross. Um, and then real quick, Ross, how did you get involved in blockchain, DLT, uh, whatever, how, what brought you here? So that's, uh, it's a long story, but I, a couple years back I was living overseas and I had um, 
uh, was remitting money back to the U.S. regularly because I worked overseas. And uh, it was always a big pain to deal with the local banks. And I then heard about, um, I mean, I had heard about Bitcoin, uh, obviously. This was like 2014. Um, everyone had heard about Bitcoin after it hit like a $1,200 in 2013, I think. But yeah, I, I had heard that people were using it for remittances, and I tried it, and it was like very convenient. And then I started getting into the protocol. Like as a programmer, I started to dig into to uh, you know how things worked um, from a sort of basic level. And then I really realized that it was about more than uh, more than you know sort of a, f a financial tool, but uh, a way to like decentralize consensus and and do things that that you know we haven't been able to do thus far. And so I kind of went down the rabbit hole and uh, built some stuff on the side and then eventually met uh, the, the folks at Sense and here I am. Cool. Um, I learned about Bitcoin uh, late 2009, early 2010 when some of my developers, I have been in technology my whole life and I had a um, what ended up becoming a digital agency, but at the time just a company that built products on the web and on mobile. And uh, my developers would run their laptops and their computers, like their large computers at my office overnight. So I just thought they were pirating software and like illegal music. And I was like, this is a very inefficient use of my bandwidth, please stop. Uh, but they explained Bitcoin mining to me and I thought at the time it was the stupidest idea I've ever heard. And I really couldn't understand until there, they showed me like there's a value and what this value system is. And I still only saw it as a financial tool, I think, for a moment. Uh, I saw the cryptocurrency aspect of it. I tried to understand the white paper and read that and really still saw that as changing the financial institutions. But it wasn't until 2014, building my first application, that I then was like, oh, this is much bigger. There's something here that's underlying that's going to change not just finance, but everything. Um, and at that point, I tried to get everybody I knew to take Bitcoin. So I paid my rent in it and my hairstylist. And I'm thinking of all the things I regret today. But it was, uh, it was a way for me to also effectively be able to transact with people who you know, might not want it to be tracked, like buying art, for instance. So it was a, it was a really interesting time watching things emerge and grow. Uh, everything we wanted to build, though, still wasn't really possible. It was, it was something that you could use the financial instrument, but you couldn't actually use the underlying technology yet. And so that took a little bit of time. And finally, in 2017, we were able to actually build. And that's, a, that's thanks to Ethereum. We did find a way to build the applications that we wanted to build. And uh, what were your names again? Ross, Ross and Crystal. Crystal. Ross and Crystal, thanks. Uh, Pavan. I work at Consensus. I'm a solutions architect. If I knew this was going to be um, EOS versus Ethereum, then I would have brought one more person that was a little smarter than I was. Um, but So I help companies uh, integrate Ethereum and Solidity into their ecosystem. Um, and I got into the blockchain space in 2013, bought some Bitcoin. Um, I was making uh, this tool to predict the stock market. I was wrong. Um, but my friend, I was building it for my friend who was an investment banker, and uh, I showed it to him, and he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm totally into Bitcoin right now. I'm like, what's Bitcoin? And then I bought some Bitcoin. And then, um, and then 2016, got into Solidity, got into Ethereum, um, got really sold into it, and really dove deep into the code. Uh, been a developer for a long time, made a bunch of dApps, uh, working on a few on my own. Um, yeah. That's me. I got one. So, uh, how I got into the crypto space, so I worked with Sensei and Team now. A crypto team. I originally was talking and working on it for about 17 years or 40 years now. And originally, we were building a chatbot. So, we were integrating into investors. Uh, we got on across different platforms and we're really just facilitating communications between people that didn't know each other. So we tried to be, you know, ask the right questions of people they might have not met before. Stuff, you know, somewhere in, in the blockchain. Uh, but we started exploring that idea as from the technology side. Like we already have a coin system where we work what we're building, so we were already somewhat familiar with that. And we started seeing how that could apply in a broader, 
space. Uh, from a product standpoint, but also from the technology standpoint, and that's when I started digging into it a little bit more uh, with the team and started learning. And as Crystal said, and what we needed to change to be able to do it on Ethereum. All right, great. So let me just do a quick uh, time check here. We have um, like half an hour to have comments, maybe a little Q&A, and then we can hang out. And I think uh, we turn into pumpkins at 8 o'clock. And uh, mics aren't great. Um, move it along kind of quickly uh, with you guys and try and uh, let's try and kind of keep things to kind of uh, quicker, more terse answers. So real quick, I'm a developer. EOS or Ethereum, what are the things I should care about if I'm the entrepreneur and if I'm the developer? What are quick reasons why you would use one or the other? Uh, one of the primary things that I care about, even though I'm, I'm, you know, my main role is engineering, I, I really dig product stuff. I, I really dig. So for me, process, Bitcoin, Ethereum, sometimes we ourselves live in a bubble and we think it's easy, but we forget about the normal person who has no clue what this is. They're just used to using the regular. So from that side, that's one of the things that I like about EOS. Yes, there is a learning curve with any kind of blockchain stuff there will be, but I think if they get over a small hump, then it becomes a little bit more transparent. I feel Ethereum is always going to be in your face, in your face, in your face, every single time you use it. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, as a developer, I, if I were launching my own dApps again and again, I would probably still use EOS. Yeah, so, I mean, it depends. If you're a developer, uh, it depends on what you're used to as a, as a developer. If you're coming out of college and you're a C++ developer and you learn that, then you're probably going to just go towards EOS because the smart contracts are written in C++. But if you're a web developer, then chances are you don't know C++ and you know JavaScript, right? Like every developer in San Francisco basically knows JavaScript. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go towards Solidity because it's, it's more JavaScript-like. Um, maybe, maybe you're really motivated and you want to learn C++, right? And then you'll get a book or you'll take a Udemy class um, or take a, cl a class for free at, at um, that community college or whatever, because you have free tuition there if you're a San Francisco resident, and take a C++ class. But chances are you're going to go into Solidity. Um, and, or, or maybe you're just looking for the ecosystem with the most amount of users using dApps, right? And I, I don't have the numbers on, on EOS. I, I, I learned how to use EOS smart contracts uh, at the EOS hackathon over the weekend. Um, but so I'm not exactly certain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm not certain how many how many DAP users there are right now on EOS. Um, uh, DAP, DAP on EOS. DAP, oh, DAP, DAP radar has EOS numbers too. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was only uh, Ethereum, but uh, but you can compare both and see who has the most number of users and go towards that. Or or wh where is the ecosystem right now? Like what what do people do with with uh, cryptocurrency right now, are they using it to use DApps or are they using it to trade? So m maybe maybe you build a solution based on who has the most amount of ERC20 tokens versus the most amount of um, it's EOS20. E EOS. Is there a ERC20 protocol for it? Okay. Got it. Okay. So um, just I guess those are my thoughts. And then. You can compare MetaMask with uh, Scatter, right? With Scatter? It's chain agnostic. Mm -hmm. So like, personally, when I tried to follow the documentation of EOS, it didn't work. Um, it, didn't, it didn't work at all. So, but when you use the things in the Ethereum ecosystem, right, like Truffle, MetaMask, they're pretty easy to work with. Uh, you follow it step by step. You do npm install truffle dash g. You have truffle. 
You do truffle init. There you go. You have your app. You do truffle compile, truffle migrate. You're done. When I did the build for EOS, um, it didn't work. And when I was talking to the mentors at uh, at the EOS hackathon, you know, a lot of them weren't able to help me. Um, you know, so some of them just said, just run the shell script and just 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 walk away. No, yeah, sure, dude, sure, yeah, totally. But what I'm saying is like. You shouldn't have to have a person next to you. You shouldn't have to have someone next to you to help you make a dApp. At the end of the day, developers are the people going to make apps. And I know you guys are making a dApp, but uh, we're talking about independent developers, right? Independent developers, uh, it, it's easier if, it, if, if the documentation works, if the directions work. And the directions work for Truffle. Uh, there are examples of how to make smart contracts and the Solidity documentation, a bunch of different examples. Um, and I just found the documentation lacking. And that's an easy fix. That's an easy fix that EOS can do. Um, I, I, would, I would prioritize that if I was EOS. Hmm? Cool. So it'll take JavaScript to convert C++. So I think com community is definitely a consideration, and that's the idea of users too. But right now, the entire crypto ecosystem, if you ask MIT and Cambridge, has 50 million users, and I even think that's generous. That's this year's numbers. So um, let's just take another number. There are, well, 8 billion or so people just under, and there are 5 billion of them on the internet. So 50 million. If you divide, that's a really tiny, insignificant number of people comparatively to the number of people with the internet. So in terms of users usage, what I look at is rather than the numbers today, as this is from the perspective of an, entrepre of an entrepreneur, I look at what's ab available to scale tomorrow. So how do, we, how do we get to scale? How do we rapidly bring on hundreds of millions of people not the thousands of people that are currently using the dApps today. And the dApps, uh, any dApp in any ecosystem today is still extremely low usage for that reason. So, you know, in terms of um, the entrepreneur's perspective, I think the number one thing we, we're thinking of is scalability. Like, where do we go from here? How do we scale? How do we get to the next level? If you're an entrepreneur raising an ICO and your number one consideration is liquidity, then maybe Ethereum is actually the better choice because Ethereum is on all of the exchanges. You have the decentralized exchanges. Now I would hesitate to say that any new token will have any liquidity to, at all though. So that might be something to take into consideration as well. EOS is just now onboarding into all the exchanges. But one thing that I think is great is we had this it was literally like three quarters. It was a golden three quarters. It wasn't even a whole year. It's like three quarters of people raising money. We had $25 billion between Q2 of 2017, Q1 of 2018 that was raised in uh, the token market on Ethereum. It was all on, you know, and this is inclusive of the $4 billion that EOS raised. Um, and inclusive, I think, of the $5 billion that Petro raised, because I will hesitate to call them a, a legitimate ICO, but it's it's really a number that's staggering because if you think about that, we've gone, come to a halt. So what happened? We hit a bear market, everything went down, and everyone went, hold on, I'm not going to spend any more of my tokens on other tokens. This doesn't make sense. Why don't I just buy Ethereum instead of buying Ethereum subtokens? It's all tied to the same, you know, to the same thing. So I think if that's a consideration, you might want to rethink liquidity of your token anyway just in general, and instead think of token economics in a more broad sense of how does it get used in the application. Both are really valid. I mean, I think the one thing is really just scale is my number one. What's next? How do we get to scale? And how do we provide the token usage inside the application? Uh, that's what will create volume. That's what will create value. Ultimately, the secondary market game is probably not something that people want to keep striving for. Um, so that's that's my thing is just kind of scalability and I look at the limitations of Ethereum because of the gas. Now if they if Ethereum moves away from proof of work, then we can we can get somewhere on that side. That's my I just don't know how long that's gonna be. Do we have any insight on the rollout of Sh uh, Shasper? <laughs> um, yeah, so we have some smart people working on it, but it's interesting seeing seeing their presentation. I, I went to Dublin and saw in, in Ireland. I I guess there's a Dublin here. 
I'm from New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> so when I said Dublin, people were like, oh, well, that's not that far. And I was like, oh, but it was really far. Uh, and people talk different. Um, <laughs> and they're like, what? They're just like right next door. And no, never mind. But anyway, um, there's a lot of work behind it. And, and it's, not, it's not something easy to roll out. So I'm surprised that protocols like Neo and EOS, uh, they, they've done it already, right? Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on EOS by any means. Yeah. And it's kind of amazing that they did it. It's kind of incredible. Or it's kind of unbelievable. That's why there's to me, right? Yeah, it just seems to me. I have to like dig deeper, but it's kind of unbelievable to me that it all works and it's all legitimate and all it's all scalable. Um, but you know, I'm not I'm not an expert on it. And um, at the end of the day, I'm I'm really open to things. I mean, we we have a partnership with Hyperledger, Ethereum, and a lot well, for a long time, people would say. Oh, Hyperledger is a competitor to Ethereum, but then you know we just partner with them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, all of these all of these things are open source, and we could work together eventually. There's Bitcoin to Ethereum swaps being worked on right now, which is going to change everything. So Bitcoin wrapped in a smart contract, and all of a sudden you could use Bitcoin inside of decentralized applications, right? Eventually, you'll have EOS wrapped inside of smart contracts. You'll have Ethereum wrapped inside of EOS smart contracts, you'll be able to transfer anything and use anything inside of any single DApp. So, so thinking about thinking thinking about which one's going to win at the end of the day. I mean, just build on what what you think is the best and try to get your user base, and then you have no idea what the future is going to have, what the future is going to hold. I mean, the Wright brothers took a plane a few feet off the ground, and 65 summers later, there's an entire infrastructure around flying planes. Now you're like, going to Dublin. Right? <laughs> right now I'm going to Dublin, right? But so, so you never know what's going to happen, but uh, yeah, anyway. So let, let, let's talk a little bit about, um, everyone talks about transactions per second and scaling and all this sort of stuff. First of all, how important is that? Um, second of all, in terms of dApps being built on different protocols. Um, well, yeah, first of all, let's talk about scale. And is that a binding constraint to build or not to build? And second of all, everyone wants to know, what's a useful dApp that's out there that's built on something that's not just about trading a token? So if uh, I'd love to hear best, best dApp award on EOS, best dApp award on Ethereum. So <coughs> I'll, I'll keep the, the best dApp award maybe for uh, Crystal, she sees a lot more dApps than I do. But on, as far as the technology goes, um, so w one thing before I, I get a little bit into that, uh, one thing that I want to acknowledge is a lot of the tooling is easier on Solidity right now. It is easier on Ethereum. It just is. Uh, I was talking to someone in the crowd earlier. Uh, they've got a head start, right? Uh, EOS literally was launched earlier this year. <laughs> it's moving fast. It's hard to build tools around something when it's moving that fast. So it, it's getting there, though. It's getting there, and, and that's it's part of the community effort. W as far as uh, building on something and, and the f speed of it. So one of the things that is challenging as a developer on Ethereum is that you're putting the responsibility on the user. And you're putting that responsibility because, and it makes sense on paper, right? I agree with it. To, to be able to control bandwidth, you gotta have this concept of gas. So you put your, uh, the responsibility on your user to say, you know what, I wanna use the network, let me pay into the network a little bit to allocate some resources for me. On EOS, you flip that paradigm. And you go, okay, you know what? Instead of asking my user to pay those resources, I, as a DAP developer, I'm going to cover that cost. Now, that doesn't mean it's an easy trade-off. It sounds great, but you're putting a lot of responsibility on the developer now to make sure they allocate enough resources so that all your users, if all of a sudden we blow up and we scale, we better have enough resources allocated in our contract to be able to cover our usage. Ethereum developers don't really need to worry about that because, again, the, the responsibility will always be on the user. Now. If we've built anything, that's the challenge, right? How many users are willing to jump through hoops just to use this new app that they heard about? I, it's hard. And, and that's why I think as far as scaling goes, uh, I'd rather pick EOS, even, even with the wonky tooling. And, and I was at the hackathon, and yes, I, I mean, I think <laughs> we were joking with Ross, the, the last two hours, three hours of the hackathon, most questions we got were, how do I reboot Docker? How do I you know, redo this in Docker? Because we don't have the nice tooling like Truffle in it and all that. 
And so it is a challenge, but I think if you're willing to work a little bit towards that, you're, you're taking the brunt of that work, but you're making it easier for your future users. And, and that's kind of the, the way I would look at that question right there. Yes, it's getting there, it's getting there. Did you want to go start? You know my favorite dab. There's only one on Ethereum. Um, and there are more than one, but there's one that everyone knows, which is CryptoKitties. And I, I would say success um, is also, I would say you could, you could measure success in what comes to mind first for a person. Uh, now, what does everybody use every day? Well, very few of them. The DAO, I think DAU, Daily Active Users, on the top uh, DAP today on Ethereum is on IDEX, and IDEX is a decentralized exchange, so it's up to us if we want to consider that a DAP or not a DAP. Um, last time I checked, which was about last week, it was um, 2,000 users a day, and they were doing um, between 40 and 60,000 users a, a month. That's their MAO. Now, if you're in San Francisco, you need to add many more zeros to that before any VC will talk to you or take you seriously. That's a, it's a pretty low number. Um, but that's, the, that's an exchange, so I don't know if that can even be considered as a consumer DAP. Now, EOS has a, a unique uh, DAP ecosystem. I would say the most successful DAP is EOS Bet, and that one was doing, you know, and it's right after launch, millions of dollars of trades a day. Um, I think that they're doing the, the MAO of IDEX 60,000 in a day. So last week they were doing 60,000 users a day. That's their DAO. So I would look at that as maybe being a comparative um, analysis on you know, where the usage is. But you know, the betting tool, the tools are really great. And they're, I haven't used all of them, but like EOS Dice, if you throw in, I think Brock, my husband, threw in $25 and did high-risk bets and got like 500 bucks. So he's just like really excited about this. And, and everybody is excited at the beginning, but ultimately, how far do gambling applications go? Who knows? I used to play online poker. It all got regulated out um, or, you know, AI'd out. The bots took it over. Right now, it's still early. It's just way too early to have a favorite DAP because I don't think there's a single DAP everyone uses every day except for maybe gambling because it's just addictive. Um, but CryptoKitties, I still think, look, they solved genetics on on the hash. Like That was so interesting, and it's still an amazing project. I talked to the founders when, when we were in Hong Kong for the last EOS hackathon, or the one before London, and, and they basically, I said, move over to EOS, and they're like, you try to do DNA on another chain. Like that is really not that easy. And and actually it, it was a really good use case. It's just the breeding takes too long. And the, you know, the, actually breeding doesn't take too long. It's just that you can't really find anybody to breed with. If somebody wants to build Tinder for CryptoKitties, that would probably be a really useful dApp. Um, but, I, but I think that there are really no good examples. Like, you know, the answer is the dApp ecosystem today the ones that I like that are coming are Everpedia, which is the Wikipedia you know, on the blockchain, um, Steemit. So, okay, let's take the top used blockchains. EOS is number one, then BitShares, then Steemit. In that order, all top three on the entire blockchain internet have been made by Dan Larimer, so that's something to nod to EOS. Um, but I think that Steemit's my favorite one in terms of my favorite used dApp besides CryptoKitties, because we'll just write that one off for now, is definitely Steemit. Do you have any others? Favorite dApps. Um, there's this uh, dApp called SenseChat. Um, I think I think it's yeah. a good one. Yeah. No, I um, I actually want to weigh in on the like developer issue as well because I got to say, as a developer, I'm jealous of all the stuff that that uh, Ethereum developers have, Ganache and Truffle. It's uh, in. It can be painful to uh, develop for EOS right now. I think it's going to get better. I hope it's going to get better. Um, it has gotten better in the last several months. Um, but yeah, uh, they're, they're, that's like uh, a problem. Um, but on the other hand, like I think EOS has great things going forward as well, uh, you know, high throughput. Um, and there are also things like uh, identity that I think uh, EOS has done a little bit better. Um, you know, human readable usernames are a great thing. You don't have to get people used to this concept of this crazy, like, nonsensical uh, address thing. They can just make an account that, that they, they uh, you know, sort of understand. Um, so, yeah, and I, but at the end of the day, I think it's like, one, it depends on what you're trying to build. Um, you know, as an engineer, you have to, you have trade-offs that you have to make. And so, like, for us, we're a messenger, and so we have two things. We have 
accounts, we have like these identities, and so EOS provides us a, a nice username to, and a nice identity system to use. Uh, we also have you know, a lot of events, things, you know, messages being sent back and forth, things happen frequently. So we need high throughput. Like, uh, but you know, maybe in another use case, maybe sort of the, the guarantees that proof of work and, and, uh, and Ethereum's consensus uh, mechanism provide are, are a, a better fit. And so yeah, um, and at the end of the day, like, I think we're all gonna win. Like, we're all working towards the same goal of providing decentralized services, uh, you know, democratizing uh, things, getting away from the sort of um, what's the, parasitic business models that a lot of the tech giants have uh, and moving towards something that's more equitable for everyone. So I think like whichever one wins, maybe it's going to be neither, uh, we're all going to win. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. That's great. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about governance. Uh, there have been a bunch of governance squabbles in the last few months, uh, most notably at EOS, but also on other blockchains. And then I thought it was really interesting last week uh, the first arbitration on EOS came back where someone who had his money stolen or her money stolen or whoever money stolen was apparently adjudicated and returned. Um, that being said, Vlad Zamfir wasn't a fan of that. He's like, well, how can that happen? And who's this guy that made the decision? And that's not decentralized. So I think that opens a really interesting host of questions, right? Um, governance. What governance guidance should there be? Is decentralization a holy cow that we shouldn't really care? I mean, it's a trade-off, right? If you're truly decentralized, then you have no kind of clawback or no way to you know, fix a, a DAO or that sort of thing. Curious on what your all perspectives are on that and if uh, one of the uh, EOS or Ethereum is solving that better than the other. Since I'm holding the microphone, um, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think like, yeah, it's still something that we're trying to figure out. I mean, in, in many ways, this is even more difficult than, than like the tech issues, uh, you know, developer tooling and things like that. I mean, we all kind of, I think, know what uh, a scalable blockchain should look like. You know, it should have a lot of transactions per second. And we all sort of know what, um, you know, nice developer tooling is like because we've used it before in, in the non like blockchain world. But what does good governance look like? I mean, we have like, it's a lot more difficult and like look at the political problems that we have in the real world. We're unable to solve these uh, and we are still wrestling with them. So to, to think that we're gonna, you know, um, come up with a, a solution to this like uh, right away is, is I think, uh, you know, a little bit, um, uh, you know, too optimistic. Um, what I, what I will say is I love, what I love about blockchain uh, and, and cryptocurrencies is that it's providing uh, this like amazing place to experiment. I mean, it's really hard to develop with, uh, or to uh, uh, experiment on a country's um, sort of like electoral system. You can't do that. You can't experiment on, on, the, on these things, really. You can only look at the real world and find, and, you know, try and sort of uh, derive uh, some insight from that. But with blockchain, we can do this. We can experiment and we can, and like, you know, sort of iterate faster. So I think that's great, and I hope I hope that we can learn things from this. Um, but that's all I have to say. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it from the other side. You know, in, tw in tw uh, April 2018, Vitalik, um, co-founder of Ethereum, said that someone should make uh, uh, kind of uh, another type of ERC20 token where it could be revert, where the transactions could be reversed by a governance, um, basically people inside the smart contract that can, can, that can decide whether it should be reversed or not. And so the head of computer science at uh, Arizona State University, um, and I wish I went there because uh, the head of computer science just blogs about solidity for fun, right? And that, I mean, that's crazy, right? Uh, so he just, he actually wrote a smart contract on exactly that on how to reverse the transaction. And his idea was, that, okay, well, you make a mistake, right? You make a mistake, you buy way too much, way too many things one day. And what do you do? You just go return them to whatever, right? On your credit card. If you can't do that with, uh, with an Ethereum transaction, or any transaction, really, a Bitcoin transaction, but you should be able to. And, you know, we should all work towards you know, actually uh, seeing that, maybe, maybe, maybe it was a mistake, but you know, actually making that a reality because transactions should be reversed if 
people accidentally made a mistake. Otherwise, no one's going to really use it. They call it retail therapy for a reason. You don't want to do the returns. But that's why we won't get to the point of sale system anytime soon with the current model. The, the um, EOS that was recovered is really interesting because we were actually present for this and the block producers were responsible for getting that money back. It was $12 million and it was attempted to be stolen off of the EOS network. And uh, when you have your token staked to a block producer because you're voting, this is where governance comes into play you uh, essentially have them locked. Locked would be a better word for it than staked. But if you have them staked, it takes three days to unstake them. So when the person stole them, they had to unstake them from the block producers and the block producers notice. Trust me, we are out there rallying for votes. We constantly are making sure that people are, you know, in everything is going well on the network. And when multiple block producers started talking to each other, then they started realizing something's wrong. And that person had the opportunity to reach out, and that's another really beautiful part of having uh, block producers, which are essentially your local constituents. You have somebody who speaks every single language representing your blockchain who can stand up for you and say, hey, I can, I'm here to contact. You can get us on any forum. You can get us on you know, every channel, Telegram, Twitter, anywhere. You know where to find the people who are producing the network. So it's not like, have you ever tried to contact your local Bitcoin miner? They absolutely don't, uh, there's nobody. Like, who are you going to talk to? So the, the governance that we're talking about is really the next level of, of humanizing the blockchain. And this is a really interesting thing. It's like, give me no governments, but give me some governance. We really do actually care deeply about having the ability to, uh, to be able to, to not control the network, but have some say in bad actors and keep it right. So I do think that that's a really interesting part of EOS is having governance that allows us to do these things. And it is controversial because it's like, wait a minute, you said decentralized, but decentralized, decentralized is a very subjective term. I would say that it's still the most decentralized and more than anything, we're gonna find out that decentralization isn't actually the goal. The goal is distributed and the goal is community. And I think that's what, that's what EOS has. So <coughs> I think Ross said that there's no easy solution to this. Uh, even now, right, I, I do like the EOS model uh, in concept. It's nice that everyone can vote, uh, but a lot of things still have to be easier. Uh, if you just look at a standard voting system, just in general, in the real world, people complain all the time it's not easy enough. How are people going to vote if it's not easy? Uh, well, Ethereum, I mean, it, you don't have votes, but you vote by being able to set up a node. Now, how likely is it going to be that you're part of that network? Probably not very likely unless you're running some very serious horsepower. Uh, on the EOS side, well, in concept, it's easy. Anyone can vote. But the reality of it is that it's not easy yet. We still need better tooling. We still need better ways of people to know, hey, I can do this on a daily basis. Hey, I don't have to set and forget and just make sure that you know the exchanges are the only ones that vote and get the top uh, block producers out there. If we can make it so that it's even easier for just regular people, uh, I mean, developers, we're the ones using all these tools that you know the block producers are using. And I know I have some tools that I see block producers working very hard for. Well, my votes are going to go towards that. Now, as developers, we're always heads down, so sometimes we forget to vote, and maybe there's all these block producers producing really quality tools, and we're forgetting to vote for them. So I think there might be very, there's still a, a layer in here missing so that we can really distribute this and make it you know, less centralized, and you know, we're working towards it. And again, it might not even be either one of these models. It might be a mixture of both. Um, I don't really know what the final answer is gonna look like. Uh, so real quick, um, in terms of just kind of like infrastructure, do you all have a perspective on wallets? Do you care? Um, is there a wallet out there that you're like, hey, this is really great? And then how does that tie into decentralized exchanges? Um, is that anything that you think will move, uh, move usability of uh, the networks forward? The wallet is moving into the chat stream. We, we're launching a wallet with SenseChat, but I think um, wallets are tough. There's so many of them. And you know, I guess maybe it's better for the developers to talk about this because which wallets interface with the dApps the easiest would probably be the answer to what's going to succeed. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. It's it's a weird. It's like I always have trouble with this. We tend to, you know, with anything new, we adapt the old metaphor to the new thing. And so we have this concept of a wallet, and then and then now they're like DAP browsers, and uh, you know people are referring to these uh, different like you know banks on on the blockchain and things like that. And it, 
it's it's difficult because I think you know we're, it's easy to understand things in, in in the context that we you know have have seen it before. S but I don't know. Is Wallet the right thing? I don't know. Is it a DAP browser? I mean, is something that like what we're doing going to become the the new paradigm? Um, I don't know. I think usability with any software is key. Uh, security um, and also providing the user. Um, I mean, that's kind of the point of cryptocurrency, right? To be able to control your own your own keys and to be able to have, um, or at least understand, you know, the, sort of the trade-offs that you're making when you don't control your own keys. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think I think like also, you know, in, uh, usability and then giving the user an understanding of what they're doing and and uh, making them sort of aware of of the whole, you know, sort of um, ecosystem that they're they're participating in. But I don't I don't have any. Uh, you know, particular thoughts on on wallets. Uh, aside from that, I just yeah, they're clearly important and clearly a thing now. But where they're going to go, I don't know. Yeah, so you know, I I echo, um, and I have a terrible memory. I forgot I forgot his name already. Um, Ross, thank you. Um, you know, uh, so there's Toshi um, for by Coinbase, and it's a DApp browser. And it makes it easy to use the DApps because there's a wallet in the DApp, in, in the in the browser. It's in the mobile browser itself. Um, so you know that's that's kind of cool. I like that. I've used it. Uh, there's MetaMask, and you could you could surf DApps using that. Um, but my favorite uh, was something I saw today um, on Friday, probably on next week. You'll you'll see a TechCrunch article about the Tachyon companies. Um, Tachyon's is accelerator that Consensus has. They put $75,000 into companies, urge you guys to apply for the next round. Um, and then they give a ton of resources, but there's a company, it's called Tap Fury, and it's a wallet. And I don't know how it works, um, but <laughs> I can't wait to see their source code. Uh, it's basically a wallet with a user registration system, and you don't manage the private keys. It's freaking insane. I don't completely trust it off the top of my head, but I, I know that Tachyon would not have um, invested their money into it and, and put the consensus reputation on it if, it if the tech didn't make sense. And the person who founded it is a former YC founder with an exit. Um, and you also get, uh, your, you, you get, you get like a, um, an Ethereum address. It's, some, it's your name, .tapfury.eth. So you can you can get crypto that way and send transactions from from that address, and you can there's a there's a recovery mode if you forget your password. So we're talking about something that the UI everything all the UI sucks for every DAP out there. It's the worst thing in the world. No one's going to use these things, right? Except the people super motivated like me, right? Super motivated because I'm into this stuff. There's a lot of people like that. I guess. Not a lot, a thousand, right? Um, <laughs> right, a thousand people out there, and then you were like, "Who's gonna run a node?" I, I, I run a node, right? Because I'm super into it. I right? run a node. <laughs> you run a node too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we're super into it, right? So, uh, but you, it needs to be easier, and there there needs to be innovation for all for all the chains out there. There needs to be better wallets um, where it's easy to log in. You can get you could have account recovery. Otherwise, no one's gonna really use it. No one's gonna really use these things. You know that Toshi changed their name to Coinbase Wallet, oh, yeah, and they yeah. took out the chat component, which is really sad, but it's cool for the chat apps that are now coming, chat apps. Um, but I think also MetaMask, maybe the counterparty to that is Scatter on EOS, and you're saying it's chain, chain agnostic, okay. more, more chain agnostic, equally difficult to use, though. Yeah. They're in, still in the browser. Um, I like EOS links now uh, in terms of EOS. Um, but still, everything is like an independent wallet. I like Jax, too. Jax kind of got leapfrogged a little bit. Everybody kind of forgot about Jax. But I like Jax. I thought Jax was a good wallet. Still is valid. Still, you know, supported all the ERC-20 tokens. Still something that I use today. Sense was in Jax early on. Um, so that one's pretty good, too. But I still feel like there are, there are tons of wallets. Bread Wallet was the wallet that I lost 200 Bitcoin in in 2014. Um, so I'd lost my phone. And I didn't back up my private keys. And there's no recovery. 
And that's the thing. I don't think I'd trust a wallet with recovery today. Now, back then, I would have been really excited about recovery. Today, I don't trust a wallet that has recovery. Like, no freaking way. Like, the, that, you know, th it sounds like the usernames are the same as the account names on, on EOS, but I think that you're, you're hitting on something, though. The, the typical user cannot, absolutely cannot, store their own private, key, private keys. Like, you just, you just can't. Like, it's just not something that's gonna be scalable. But this is also why end-to-end -end encryption doesn't fundamentally work on messaging, because you can't give the users the private keys to unlock the messages, so, you know, all of your messages that you think are super private are still stored on somebody else's server anyway. Then we have a weird fundamental challenge of, of, like, how do I provide my own wallet in my pocket, like cash, and be cool with losing, you know, if you lose your actual wallet, you might lose 200 bucks. If you lose your actual, you know, phone, crypto wallet, you lose 200 Bitcoin, that's a little bit more. So it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, so I like to kind of um, step back a little bit. When we talk about crypto wallets, it's not really a wallet. So, uh, and again, we call it a wallet because we need people to understand what it is. But the cool thing is really a wallet, all it is is having a way to sign a transaction on your device, whether your device is a browser, whether your device is a phone. That's all it is. It's the cryptography. That, that's literally what you think of when people say wallet. They're really just thinking, how do I run the cryptography to sign a transaction correctly on whatever device I'm using? Now, here's the cool thing. Uh, and we were experimenting with this. Uh, Ross and I have been playing with this. The cryptography is the same. Really, it, it's literally the same cryptography that EOS uses, that Ethereum uses, that Bitcoin uses. And all we're doing with that cryptography is we're just formatting it a little bit differently. So literally, it's like changing the font almost, right? You're just formatting it different. EOS has a format, how they like formatting their, their public key and private keys. Ethereum has their format. But underneath the hood, it's the same thing. So that kind of opens up things because when you build a wallet or a signing device, then you can build it so that it can sign for any network, really. And, and at that point, you open up a lot of possibilities. So when, when you think about wallets, now you start getting into, okay, so if all it's doing is signing transactions, how do I make sure that the signing part of a transaction is easier? And if signing transactions can apply for a transfer, then it can apply for anything else. It can apply for using dApps. It can apply for uh, securing messages. It can apply for a lot of things. So is there a wallet out there that has done it all? No, I think we're just kind of in the initial phases. Uh, Crystal mentioned links. I, I know those guys, I love those guys. It's a very nice wallet, but I'm not using EOS anything on a daily basis. So what's next then? How, how do I create a dApp that I can sign transactions, that I can send tokens, but I'm also a habitual user of it, right? So that's kind of the challenges that are out there right now, and it's, it's wide open. We're working on a solution, but it's not the only solution. There's still a lot of things that, that we think we can do with that. Okay, we're now within the last 10 minutes, so I'm just going to ask you all to make a real quick prediction for the next year. And in fact, uh, our last Crypto Mondays um, of the season is going to be December 3rd. We're going to have a whole prediction panel. But if you all go down the line, make a quick prediction of something that you think uh, is needs to happen or will happen, and then we'll take a couple questions from the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm very bad at predictions. I predict I'll have a little bit more white hair, a couple more problems <laughs> to run into. Uh, but there will be a lot of cool things that we're going to be looking back in a year. Uh, the hackathon really, really was cool, whether it's an EOS or, or Ethereum. I'm sure it's the same way. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of hungry people building very cool things. And some of those things they're building are tools that I can use, and that makes my life a lot easier. Uh, the more tools I have, the cooler things I can build. So I think there's going to be a lot more tools, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's EOS, whether it's another chain. So that's my prediction. And with tools, I think so it sucks that the market kind of tanked, right, and it's stuck. But I actually kind of dig it because a lot of people then focused on, oh, we can't just launch tokens. We actually have to build stuff. And that was super cool because we are actually seeing people focus heads down on building stuff. So I think we'll have a lot more of that next year. So I see you're happy about the market tanking. I was a little upset, <laughs> you know, seeing 90% of my value go down. Um, but uh, it was kind of good because you, you kind of thin the herd, right? It's, it's always good to... To take out to take out the people that aren't really bringing any value to the ecosystem, um, so it's easier to just you know say point and be like, hey, do you work in blockchain? You're probably doing something useful because you're still here. Um, I think it, I think in the next year it's going to get a lot easier to use these DApps. I think a lot more people will be using DApps. You'll see actual use cases come about. When the internet came around in the 90s, you know most most executives they 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 printed out their email. They had their secretaries print out their email. 
They didn't know how to use email. And matter of fact, most people didn't um, see email being valuable. You know, they, they didn't understand it. I know it's probably hard to even understand, but in the, in the 90s, that's what happened. And now, who doesn't have an email address, right? Who doesn't? And then back in the day, there was a company, he spoke for my class. Um, I teach a class, and he came in and spoke. It was the biggest failure ever. Uh, he raised a billion dollars. He basically built Amazon in the 90s. It was just a little too early. It was a little too early. But then Amazon came out, you know, at, at the right time, you know, made the right moves and stuff. You'll see, you'll see, you'll see dApps with actual use cases in the, in, besides finance being used. Yeah, totally agree with that. I think 2019 is the year of the DAP. Also the year of the security token. That's coming. Um, we're all looking to, you know, T0 for their securities exchange. Patrick Byrne mo moving as quickly as they can. They have spent so much time and money in regulation, uh, you know, for uh, from the outside criticizing anyone that's working in the overall ecosystem who is potentially going slower than you thought, it's really tough. It, the regulatory landscape is so hard. But I think that's the next step for tokens, at least. Tokens are going to be security tokens. In terms of the market, I hesitate to ever put a prediction on the market because if you're familiar with uh, John McAfee's Twitter feed, I leave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> he can do all of the predicting for us. But I do think it's really Interesting, if we wrap up this year and Bitcoin hasn't changed or is marginally changing by the end of the year, that means we went one entire year with the same price. That's a really huge nod to stability. So I'm actually pretty cool with where we are right now. Um, you know, at the end of last year, a couple people, I, I remember being on a panel and someone said, it's going to go to $10,000. And it was like, and everybody's like, yeah, no, no way, no way. And then it did. And then everyone was really shocked. And they're like, okay, it's going to go to $100,000. We're all in, all in, all in. You know, and when you have people start to ask you to buy Bitcoin and it's at like 15 grand and you're like, no, seriously, don't buy my Bitcoin right now. And you're like, okay, just go ahead and buy it if you want to. But I wouldn't buy it. I would sell it. And if I'm selling it, you should probably shouldn't buy it. So that's, you know, that's the thing. I think um, I, would, I would hesitate to ever make a market prediction, but this year I actually will. I will say that I think the market is stabilizing. So that's a positive. I'm also happy that the market uh, tanked or is not really going anywhere um, because I don't have to look at my block folio every 10 minutes and I have more time for doing other things. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, prediction wise, I'm, I don't like making predictions either. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I hope that we see, yeah, like real, real use cases. And okay, I'll w I will make a prediction. I think that the, it's going to be unexpected. It's not going to be like what we think it's going to be. Um, like the, the first like thing that gets a lot of adoption and a lot of interest from like sort of mainstream uh, folks is going to maybe be something that we don't expect it to be. Sense chat, perhaps. Oh, I, that would be nice. Um, and also, I think it's not going to come from uh, here. Like, San Francisco or maybe even the US like it's gonna come from somewhere else that that uh, you know um, where people you know can can I, I just this is like a you know I have nothing to back this up this is just what I feel um, this is why I don't make predictions um, but yeah that's that's it I have nothing else to say uh, okay my prediction is that next year is going to be the year of CX customer experience CX UI UX, as you said, um, the interfaces of most of the stuff is just totally fucking unusable. And everyone knows that, right? So I mean, to the extent that you look at what happened in the enterprise world, and the enterprise world got a kick in the butt when people walked in and said like, no, I'm not going to use your travel booking system. I'm using Uber. And uh, I worked at Oracle at the time. And Oracle's like, we're not going to reimburse your Uber. And everyone just said, screw you. And they just turned in their expense reports with Uber on it. And they finally said, OK. You know, so I think that's kind of what's going to happen. That, that needs to happen to get kind of broader um, uh, usability. Speaking of broader usability, I have a bet with my son over there, that guy. He's written a little form for feedback uh, that we tweeted out at SF Crypto Mondays. And he's like, Dad, the people here are way too hip to fill out something on paper. They want a link. <laughs> Don't make me hand out paper. So um, who here is absolutely not going to go to the Twitter and fill out the thing online. If you're not going to, raise your hand and he'll give you a piece of paper. But otherwise, he'd like people. OK, this guy. No, it's just, uh, it's just a Google form. It's just a Google form. 
Yeah. So we just want your feedback. And this guy's on the panel. Okay, you're fired. Um, but uh, any, <laughs> okay. We'll give you live um, feedback. Seriously. So I mean, what we try and do is we try and get your feedback to find out what works, what doesn't work, what you'd like. Uh, and we're almost coming up on the first full year of Crypto Mondays, which is kind of cool. We have 900 members in our meetup, and uh, we just want to make this a more vibrant community. Again, if you look at the word community. The tail end of it means unity, right? Like I said earlier. So that's what's really important, and that's what we're trying to build here is a community, which is unity for everyone who's interested in blockchain and crypto. So uh, SF Crypto Mondays, you can uh, go there and fill out the form. If anyone wants a piece of paper, raise your hand, and that gentleman will come over and hand it out, and <laughs> he'll collect it afterwards. Sorry. All right, uh, any questions from the audience before we wrap up? Okay, we have a cyber. Okay. Uh, my question is, what's with all the interest in stable coins? I felt like it skipped over security tokens, and now we're seeing like stable coins. I think like Bitcoin's like the best stable coin right now, but like, what's with all the tokens launching as stable coins now? And I'd ask you guys to do kind of quick answers. So I, I, for me personally, I wish that I had really embraced Tether in January and just been like, you know what, I'm just gonna stabilize all my crypto right now. I think that the biggest challenge is probably the developing nations. I actually, for me personally, I think most of the stable coins are not gonna go very far, and I think we don't need a lot of stable coins, and we especially don't need stable coins that are asset backed by assets that are volatile, like US dollars. That doesn't make that much sense to me either. So for me personally, I don't really have an, an like I see fiat money as volatile, and I see fiat money as something that will be going in, in a very downward spiral in the next few years. Again, I don't want to make predictions either, but I think that stable coins are really a, a very weird anomaly, especially if they're asset backed by things like gold. Uh, we already have currencies that are, or used to be, backed by things like that. If we're backing them on government currencies, we're kind of going the opposite direction. Um, but I think maybe it's just a matter of wanting to be more usable wanting to be able to do things like remittances. I think uh, Philippines is a really great example of uh, a, a country that is leveraging blockchain, just like Kenya, same thing, like with Coins PH, Kenya has the M-Pesa, that are s not tied to their currency, but something that has mass enough adoption to where there's no volatility. But I don't really know personally how we can go. I don't know why everybody's making a stable coin. I think they just feel like, well, if it's stable, it won't go down. Yeah, and the business model of stable coins, I kind of scratch my head at as well. So, so there's MakerDAO um, on on Ethereum, and it's, it's really interesting. I won't go into it. We don't have time, but check out the white paper. Just how it works is super interesting. They kind of decentralize the Federal Reserve um, with the way they made their stable coin. And it has some value with loan, with loans on the blockchain, because uh, if if I give if I if I give you my Bitcoin and you loan it out, like what's going to happen if Bitcoin skyrockets randomly? Uh, the collateral that that person provided um, to, to to take on the loan, it's not going to be enough to give me back my Bitcoin if it goes up to a million dollars. So. Instead of taking Bitcoin, it's better to take a stable coin and then give me interest on the stable coin rather than giving interest on the Bitcoin. If, by the way, there are things out there that will give you interest on your Bitcoin, don't trust them. Yeah, wasn't there one where you got 40% a month? Uh, Bitcoin! Well there's, well, there's Celsius Network, and they give you 3.5% interest on, their, on your Bitcoin. But I, I, I think it's a scam. You could try things that are overtly Ponzi schemes. They even say it on their website, like FOMO, FOMO 3D. I think it's called FOMO 3D. Yeah, and it's like, we are a Ponzi scheme. This is how it works. Um, put in your money, and you're going to get more money until people stop putting in money. And it's really, you know, it is it, as long as you're aware of what you're getting yourself into when you're making bets like that, I think it's okay. But yeah, definitely don't, uh, don't, don't buy those increases. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I, he I heard you just comment on Celsius. What do you think about the recent announcement by Cred? They partnered with PricewaterhouseCoopers and Uphold. 
on doing something very similar as Celsius paying interest. On I mean, it's, it's interesting. As long as as long as like what's being lent out isn't isn't volatile, then I, I think I think it's it's interesting. And if they if they show you what what the smart contracts are that you're interacting with, then then it makes sense. If they don't reveal that information, then it, it, I wouldn't trust it. I mean, there there are DApps out there that do have a lot of usage, and they don't release their smart contracts. It's kind of it's, it's risky for the person using it. But if they have big names behind it, I mean, public companies, I mean, maybe I don't know. Yeah, but if it's if it's a no one, then make sure you look over the smart or have a dev look over the smart contract to make sure it's it makes sense. Before there's before so much it. to talk about. I mean, we could be here all night. So. Um, Crystal, go ahead. Oh, I'm just holding the mic. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, huge thanks to this like amazing all-star panel. Thank you very much. And then for the record, I just want to let you know the last three Crypto Mondays, our panels have been uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We've had nine women and three men over the last three crypto Mondays, just so you guys know, okay? So there are a lot of women in blockchain who wanna come out mm -hmm. and uh, share their expertise. So thank you to all of you, and uh, if you have any questions, you can maybe you can spend a few minutes and chat offline. Thanks again, see you guys December 3rd. Cheers.